Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, this is Greg Brown from the Foundry, and today we have with us Nicholas Stevenson, uh, who works at Raven Games. Say hello, Nick. Hey, hello. <laughs> and uh, Nick is a scripter. Uh, I met Nick hanging out in the Moto Indie, Moto and Mari Indie chat room, I guess about a year ago, and he was really quiet. He just hung out in the chat room, didn't say much, and every now and then he'd say something really smart. <laughs> it was just like, oh, this guy isn't, isn't new to this. What has he been doing? And so I asked what he did, and it turns out he's, he's you know, actually works at a major game company. And uh, he even helped me out after I found out he was really good at scripting. I was like, hey, could you maybe take a look at our new scripting tools in 901? Because um, we have all the, the new scripting layout, and we have this new TD SDK. And could you see how much easier it would be to maybe make a, uh, a Doom 3 importer, exporter? Yeah. Um, I, I like to do totally useless things, <laughs> like, but I have a, an affection for that engine. And he was like, yeah, sure, I'll try it out. And uh, we kind of played with it, and he actually made an importer-exporter from Doom 3, which was extremely freaking cool. And so I thought Nick would be a great uh, person to kind of show off some of the scripting tools in Modo, how to use them, especially from an artist's perspective. And you know, that, that's really what it comes down to, especially talking to a lot of artists out there. Um, you know, How do we communicate to other artists how to use more advanced technical tools like scripting tools? And this is something I've been personally looking forward to, is learning a little bit more about scripting. Um, so, uh, Nick, I uh, definitely want to ask you uh, a few quick questions before we get started. Oh, there's my email. Absolutely. That's great. And uh, <laughs> um, so you currently work for, uh, for Raven. How did you end up, uh, you know, um, getting, uh, moving to a company like that? And did you start there? Uh, yeah, actually, that was where I started about, I've been over there uh, for just a little over 10 years. I was going at a, to a local technical college uh, for animation, and I got a uh, one of the instructors used to work at Raven, and he, you know, got the word that Raven needed some interns, uh, two interns, and I was one that he picked, and I was pretty fortunate at that. I started at Raven and eventually was hired and started kind of like moving up, and I lucked out getting, you know, getting a job in the industry in my hometown, and that was something that I did not expect to happen. You know, listening to people in the industry, it's like, you know, pick one of the coasts or pick New York, you know, and I knew that Raven was in the area, you know, just you know, 12 miles away, but, you know, it, it seems like at the time they were making, you know, Star Wars Jedi Knight and stuff like that. And it was, it was like, yeah, fat chance, but, you know, yeah, it, it, you know, things turned out really well. You know, Raven is actually one of my, like, I guess, as far as, uh, you know, being a bit of a fanboy, one of my companies I'm a, a bit of a fanboy with, uh, you know, talking about Doom 3 and id from the past and stuff like that. Raven always took id's engines historically, you know, um, before when they were part of Activision and made some of the best games out of those engines. And Jedi Knight was one of those games that, oh my god, I just, I, I couldn't get enough of. And I uh, thought Raven just nailed it with that. And didn't, uh, didn't you guys also do like Return to Castle Wolfenstein? Uh, we did a Wolfenstein game that was also done uh, in Radiant. That was, um, and this, for anyone listening, this is not the most recent Wolfenstein that came out. This one was a launch title for the Xbox 360, so probably about seven, six, seven years ago now. Um, but yeah, that was another Wolfenstein, uh, another, you know, shout out the Wolfenstein uh, era uh, that Raven put together, yeah. That's extremely cool. All right, well, um, so uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Gratuitous question. We just have this in our questions list. Feel free to be like, hell no, I'm not answering that. Um, but are you working on anything special that you can talk about? If not, that's totally okay. Uh, yeah, I probably can't talk to, I mean, I can talk about like the, maybe the <laughs> recent stuff that we've worked on, but even then, I mean, it's, we try to stay away from like, we did this and we did that. You know, it's, it's kind of like when a game comes out, it's like we get our names in there and we're like, yeah, you know, we did, you know, we, we helped, but you know, we try to stay back from saying like, this was ours and this was ours. Cause you know, it's, it's really the end product that is like the more, you know, the more, the more important thing than kind of what we worked on. But, um, uh, yeah, I, We've uh, we've kind of been working in the in the Call of Duty universe at Raven um, since Modern Warfare 3 and beyond. Um, as of you know maybe like five years ago or something, I can't think of when we kind of transitioned into the Call of Duty universe, and we've been kind of like hopping from production to production, helping out with you know all of the all of the major ones. You know, no, that really out, so. that really says a lot. I mean, the quality of the games I've seen come out of that studio. You know, what you just explained explains a lot about that. Yeah. Um, so okay, what is your actual title? Uh, I'm a, well, technically I'm a, a senior animator, um, but 
in in like HR speak, since they don't kind of create this like harsh, you know, uh, line between all of the different departments. But technically, I'm a lead technical animator in charge of rigging and tools for the uh, for the animation department. Um, I have two other cohorts that work with me, and we kind of supply uh, mocap and animation with all of the tools and scripts and rigs and things like that 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 they use. Okay, very cool. No, uh, it, in, in technical art, it just, artist just sounds super cool. Um, it is one of those things. It, it's like I remember, you know, um, I spent a lot of time on Steam, for those who don't know, but uh, meet a lot of people who are new to 3D, and the, the statement I always hear over and over again, like people are like, I want to be involved in games. And then you ask them, like, okay, well, how do you want to be involved with games? And then they always say, I want to be a game designer. And it's like, Okay, so what do you mean by game designer? <laughs> you know, like, I don't think you know exactly what that means. Um, so it's one of those things that really helps to, for people to hear what the various disciplines are. Like, for instance, there's not really a technical artist role in visual effects. It's more of a technical director. And you talk about technical yeah. artist to somebody in VFX, they're like, what is that? You know. And so it's important to understand uh, these various uh, roles that you can play at, at these various companies and in different uh, um, different industries or related different industries. All right, so what was the very first 3D application you used? Oh, going way back, probably uh, probably 3DS Max, you know, getting getting started. Um, oh, hello? Yep, hello, no, that Brandon, oh, Brandon oh. keeps, that, that <laughs> beat for everybody that doesn't know, Brandon keeps on, I think, trying to make his mic work. Um, oh, gotcha. <laughs> I that, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm missing Brandon right now, desperately. Uh, but uh, you know, I don't know if Brandon's going to make it onto, the, onto this one, actually. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Max, yeah, that's that's a pretty common answer. So what made you gravitate towards Modo? Uh, well, yeah, it started with Max, and I, that's what that was the program that we were using in the, the, uh, in the um, college that I was going to was, was Max. And I was looking for something more creative. Like, it seemed like... <sighs> Max was kind of clunky, maybe a little long in the tooth. You know, I knew I knew Maya, and that seemed like, you know, another complete uh, different direction. Um, you know, as far as like polar opposites of like applications, and you know, I kind of I could kind of work with both of them, but it just seemed like I was looking at what was new. You know, like what was kind of coming out, and at that time, I think it was Moto Two Hundred Three um, that I had stumbled on on like the CG Talk forums or something, and I I downloaded it, and it was you know like I. I was done, you know, like I, the, the modeling tools were just intuitive. It's like, depending on what sub object type you're in polygon or edge or whatever, like the cut tool, you know, just works. Like you don't have a cut faces tool and a cut edges tool. You know, it's like you just turn on the cut tool and, and it intuitively knows what it's supposed to do. And it seems, it seemed at the time, like this makes perfect sense, but nobody else was doing any of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as soon as I got into Moto, it was, you know, it just, it clicked. Yeah, well, I mean, that is what we hear over and over again. That's my experience and, and most uh, most other people who use it at this point. And so it's almost one of those questions that everybody has the same answer for, but I sure don't mind reiterating it over and over again. Oh, we have a lot of other questions, but uh, man, uh, just like interview questions and stuff, they take up a lot of time. And frankly, I'm interested to see uh, what you have to show as far as using Modo scripting tools, because I need to learn how to script. And so this is very very useful to me um, as it is to everyone else. So, you know, without further ado, if you're ready to go, I'd love to see what you uh, put together to show us today. Uh, yeah, absolutely. This, um, so to start, it, this is going to be a bit more talking, um, but I kind of want to go through the, the, the basics of kind of like where the TDSDK came from. Um, but yeah, definitely ask lots of questions because like listening to me talk is probably going to be slightly more exciting than actually working in Python, but, you know, hopefully we'll see. Um, but I just want to say that I am not a formally trained programmer. So if anyone is is interested in this, um, you know, I kind of surround myself with a lot of really smart people and and I latch onto them and I ask questions and I, I know where to go for help. Um, but I didn't go to school for computer science and I'm you know not an engineer. Um, but you know, so you can still get into this. You know, it's I think in some way that by going through like animation and mocap and eventually making it to tools kind of informs how I approach things and, you know, like how I put tools together, uh, making them as intuitive and inviting as possible without getting kind of wrapped up in, you know, turning it into like the most amazingly designed tool uh, in existence. Um, but yeah, so definitely ask lots of questions. If you guys have any, uh, anything that you're curious about, I'll try to answer it. Um, uh, let's see my notes that I have. Uh, so to get started before diving into the new TDSDK, I kind of wanted to cover uh, like the the genesis of the TDSDK, where it kind of came from and what it was meant to answer in Modo. 
And to kind of explain where the Moto has always had Python since the beginning, um, but the Python that Moto has is generated off of its C, C++, and this is a very common approach that most 3D applications take. When they make an SDK, they kind of like make it from like this base and then they generate the C++ code and then they generate the Python code. And um, it's, that means that the Python that Moto has is really powerful and that anything that you can do pretty much in C++, you can also do it in Moto's Python with exceptions. Um, the problem is that it tends to make your Python code very C++ looking. Um, like a lot of the things, the ways that you interact with things in the scene, the way that you push things back to the scene, um, the way that you get items is very how you would do it in C++. And in classic C++ fashion, it takes like three times the amount of code to do anything. And by basing Moto's Python off of that, you've kind of lost a little bit of the elegance of, of what in, makes Python like an inviting scripting language. Um, but you know, on the upside, if you're interested in C++, you can build your tools in, in the Python that Moto has currently, and you can kind of translate your, your stuff over to C++ and back and forth, so you can kind of work in it if that's your goal. But again, if you just want to stick with Python, you've lost a lot of the elegance of Python. So getting into the TDSDK, um, I have an example of Moto's classic Python. And just to explain uh, kind of where this code came from, um, leading up to the release of Moto 901, Shane Griffith in the, in the forums posted a teaser image uh, before 901 had landed of a multi-line Python editor that you can see you know, over here that you know, prior to that point, Moto didn't have, and a new TD SDK of a snippet of code that before that point, nobody knew existed. And I was, I was floored. It was like the one thing that I was hoping for, that I was asking for, you know, knowing how, the, how Moto's Python was kind of built. It, I saw that and I was just so excited. And um, you know, people were excited in the forums as well, but just for fun, I took the code that he posted and turned it back into the, the Python that Moto had currently had at the time, which I'll keep referring to as the LX, LXU modules. There's a few more things in there, but primarily like in Python, when you want to work with something, you import um, the, the, the module that you want to work with. And these are just the Moto modules. And those are the ones that are based off of the C++. Um, so to just kind of quickly go through like a little bit line by line, like um, you, you have to create kind of getting a little a little fast talking here, but you know you have to kind of create a, a scene item, a scene selection service item, and then here's your current scene. And this guy is what is used primarily for like getting things in your current scene and pushing things back to the current scene. Um, oh, I should explain, uh, getting ahead of myself, I should explain what the code was meant to do. Basically what it did was it pulled from the current scene, all of the cameras printed out their name and printed out their focal length. So I kind of recreated that code here um, going down a few lines, you get the camera symbol, and then you turn that symbol into a camera ID. This is all very C++. And then you do the same thing with the focal length. And then a little bit further down, there's a channel reader. And this is kind of, this is straight out of C, C++. Like before you can actually read or write to a channel, you have to create an item whose sole purpose is to do exactly that. Um, and, and so we have a channel reader here. And then when you get the number of cameras in the scene, it doesn't actually give you the camera, it gives you how many are in the scene. So then I have a little loop down here that says, okay, uh, how many cameras are in the scene? Pluck out each camera one at a time. And now I've got the name of the camera. And then down here, I have that channel reader where I'm reading the focal length of the camera. And then you know at the very bottom, you can finally print out the camera name and the focal length. And I'll split my view and I have the same code uh, that Shane had posted um, using the new TDSDK. And I think that this uh, really illustrates the beauty of the TDSDK, the readability, the approachability. Um, you know, in classic C++ fashion on the left, you've got three times as much code to do the same thing. Now, in defense of C++, you know, it's meant to be more memory oriented. Like if you get a mesh item from the scene and you don't need to walk through all of the polygons and verts and edges and crap like that, it doesn't oblige you with the ability to do that. You have to kind of create the item that is meant to do that. You know, so the, the new Python kind of, you pay a little bit of overhead for it, um, that it, it kind of comes with all of that stuff, but you don't have to go through all of the hassle of, you know, creating it and doing it to do the same thing. So over here on the right, 
uh, import moto. That is the new TD SDK Python module oh, that you import to work with it. And you've got, you know, a single scene item for the most part that you get to deal with. And there's, you know, there's even a tag, uh, a property on the scene item that allows you to get the cameras in the scene. Um, and unlike the other code, it, it gives you the actual camera. You don't have to kind of pull it back from the scene based on the camera's number. And then from there, you can say, what's your dot name? And that's how you access the name of the item. What's your focal length? You know, reading from an item's channel is just as easy. It's just dot channel, the name of the channel that you want, and dot get. Um, this is how you get the value. And you can set the value just as easily with dot set. And then from here, you can print out the camera's name and the focal length. So I just wanted to kind of explore or kind of explain what, where the TDSDK came from, what it was meant to solve. Now, the TDSDK doesn't touch all corners of Moto. You might still have to go back to the to the older LX LXU modules, the, the C++ modules. But in my experience, like it's on version one, and I really have not had to do that that much. Um, to get more into kind of the inner workings, because I think it's kind of important to know how it's put together to understand how to work with it and like what it's doing. The the C plus plus or the the TD SDK is built on top of the LX LXU modules, and this is something that not a lot of programs do. Like usually when you have another programming language, it's um, you know they don't talk to each other. You either kind of pick one or you pick the other, and and you kind of you can kind of code yourself into a corner. If you encounter something that this one that you picked can't do, you can't switch to the other one. But the TDSDK is built on all of the C++ Python that's already available. And that has a cool knock-on effect. Um, so I'm in a code editor that allows me to do this. Um, and just you know, FYI, you don't need a code editor. It makes things a lot nicer, but you don't need one, but it allows me to kind of do what I'm about to do. So with the TD SDK open on the right hand side over here, if I hold down the control button, I can kind of hover over things and it gives me a little bit of documentation about what that thing does. And if I hold on control and click on something, I can enter the TD SDK. And this is something that um, not a lot of programs do as well is the TD SDK is completely readable Python text. Um, again, like other programs, usually it's like a binary file or like a compiled plugin. Like you can't see what's going on in there. You know, it's kind of clunky in that way. You have to, you have to trust that, you know, the engineers are putting together documentation to find this stuff somewhere. But the cool thing is the TD SDK is just straight up Python. And since it's using the older C++ Python, you actually have, you know, it's kind of rather advanced Python looking at it, but you have an outline for how to do tons of stuff using the older the the classic C++ Python in you know the the new TD SDK it has examples for everything that it's doing which kind of I found this almost as useful as dedicated documentation it's like I had examples for all of the things that I might have needed to do now that I have the TD SDK I don't really have to worry too much about that but it was a really cool a really cool difference that the TD SDK um, did and I don't see a lot of programs going that route and I was you know just like seeing how this thing was put together it was really cool uh, really cool to see um, so now that I've kind of gone through like where the TDSDK came from and and the oh hello my screen has frozen hello. Hello. Yeah. what was it okay oh, okay I see the screen going here Okay, excellent. Uh, my mouse had uh, locked up for a second there. Anyway, <laughs> live presentations and all that. Um, so I just wanted to go through a few places of where you can find help. Um, there are, obviously, I have a web browser over here. There are a few places, you know, the main Moto um, Foundry website. Uh, there's a community forums. And, you know, just scrolling down from the top, there's an SDK and plugin forum. And there's also a scripting and macros forum. So if you need to ask questions, if you're curious, you can you can post here. And chances are people will, you know, either already have um, posts about things that you're after or people will answer and, and help. Um, in addition to that, there's also a wiki dedicated to the new TD SDK that has you know, examples and tons of code and tons of text and help documents and things like that, that goes through all of the things that you can do. And then in addition to that, there are, um, there's a Skype channel um, for chatting. Um, and these channels actually have, um, 
actual Foundry developers sitting in them. So like in a lot of times when you ask a question, you'll see a name pop up of an actual Foundry developer. Um, and the Skype channel has several of them. There's another another newer one. There's a Slack group if, you know, like if you're interested in that, you know, there's a lot of places. There's some um, some unique names in one or the other, but there's a lot of cross pollination, a lot of familiar names between them. And then, and then of course, there's the Steam channel, uh, the Steam chat. And there's, you know, this one's geared more towards Moto Indie and Mari Indie, but there's still plenty of us who kind of sit in there and, and talk about all of that stuff. And um, to kind of get in why I'm using a code editor, there's, um, you don't, again, you don't need one, you don't have to use one, but there's a few benefits. And one of the things is that you can kind of get like interactive help, like when you're working in, you know, Moto, there's a, there's a few videos that I've created and a few, a few that are already posted for how to do all of this, but you can kind of get like live documentation as you're working. But, you know, if I hop over to Moto's editor, let's see, create a scene item, Moto.scene, and that's how you get your, your currently active scene. The, the one that you're kind of clicked into. And if I do scene dot and hit tab, it kind of shows me all of the things that I can do with my current scene. And you can kind of do the same thing in your code editor too. Um, but I just, I wanted to say that the reason why you work in a code editor sometimes is because if you do a lot of heavy lifting in Moto and you kind of, or you like hit a loop that you can't get out of and you've locked up Moto, you kind of lose the code that you've you've created. So, you know, as you're starting, I totally prototype all of my code in, in the, in the scripting interface of Moto, but that's, I kind of copy it back over to my code editor just to kind of save it. Um, and as you get more familiar with Python and stuff, you can do more stuff in your code editor, um, or you can just sit, you know, in Moto scripting interface and it's, you know, it's getting even more robust as each service pack hits. Um, but I suppose now I should get into a few examples of the things that you can do. And, you know, these are going to kind of be kind of long-winded examples. I don't want to assume that anyone, you know, knows Python who's watching or someone who has no idea what Python is. I kind of want to go through things like one at a time and then cover some of the things that you're going to see as you learn Python. So I have an example here of how to get all of the meshes in the scene. So at the very top, I have import moto, and that's just the TDSDK. And then from the Moto module, you can request the currently open scene, which is the next line down here. And I just store that in a variable called scene. Um, and this, this is the object that allows you to kind of get things from the Moto scene that you're working in, kind of push changes back, query how many cameras you have and how many meshes and things like that. The next line down is a little nitty gritty Python, um, little, little kind of a detailed programmer speak. Um, this is, uh, from the Moto module, I'm requesting the mesh type from the constants file. T to explain what this is, uh, the constants file, and on the C++ side, it's called a symbol file, a, uh, a symbol module. What this me is meant to do is kind of every Moto object type, channel, like render output, pretty much every item type in Moto and channels and things like that has an entry inside the symbol file. And I just want to cover this because you might see it and, and wonder what, why it's there. The idea is that if you need to, for example, get the focal length of a channel and, and you know, in your code, you're getting the focal length channel from the symbol file. If in future versions of Moto, maybe the focal length channel gets renamed or it gets broken into like two, you know, two other types of channels or they, they kind of merge it into something else. The idea is that your code is pulling from that symbol file, which is maintained by the foundry, and you're getting the actual, like the actual, like low level place of where you, you pull that code from, where you, how you access that channel. And that if that changes down the road, you don't have to kind of go back and maintain your code to fix it. Whereas if you kind of like embedded like the literal name of the channel in your code, your code might technically have to be updated to kind of reflect the changes in naming things. So to my understanding, that's kind of how, how it's meant to work. And it's kind of C, C++, um, you know, the way that you interact things. Basically, you just kind of like, you pull things, you pull data from other places, like, like even the mesh type. And that's basically what this line is meant to do. And now that I've kind of covered that, if I go down a few lines, um, from the scene item, I can say just dot items which will give me items from the scene. And then I can say 
of item type mesh. And then I'm using that same symbol that I pulled from. And this will give me back all of the meshes in the scene. So it's very, very simple to kind of cover. I wanted to cover what the symbol file is because if you're kind of like learning, if you start to get help from people, um, if you look at examples online, you might see that and wonder like what that is. And that that can be real, like real crushing as you're like trying to learn something and there's, you know, they're doing something and you don't understand even why it's doing it that way. I wanted to cover like what the symbol file is. So um, hopefully everyone's, you know, still with me. Um, but, you know, I'm just kind of covering the basics of Python because I don't want to assume that anyone, you know, knows everything that I'm talking about. So before I get into the next example, and it turned out, it turned into a slightly more complex example than I expected, um, I wanted to cover another thing that you're going to see a lot as you're learning Python. And, and I'll be posting all of these examples so you guys can kind of root through them. Um, Another thing that you're going to see a lot, and if you ask for help in like Skype or you like post on the forums, people might throw these things out there and assume that you know what they are. But if you're just learning Python, it can be really confusing and, and uh, you know, you can get lost really fast. So first I'm gonna go through how you do something. And this is called list comprehension, kind of a complex word, but I wanted to cover um, how it works and kind of why, because I, I have a feeling you're going to see this a lot so first, I'm just importing Moto, which is the TDSDK. I'm getting all of the scene items in the scene, like I did previously, but I'm not giving it a type. I'm just saying, give me all of the items in the scene. And then down here, I want to get all of the items in the scene that don't have parents. So just, you know, if I go to my example scene, uh, you know, it's kind of everything that, you know, it would actually be everything in the scene right there, but anything that was parented, it would chuck out. So I just wanted to see how I could get all of the root items. So first I would create a Python list and that's what the square brackets are meant to do. They just, you know, that's an empty list. Any time that you see square brackets, that's just a standard Python list. And I'm going to name it root items. And then I have a simple for loop where I'm spinning through all of the items in the scene that I've, that I previously got. So the scene items is going to give me a list of items. And then this for loop is going to go through them one at a time. And for each item that is in scene items, it's going to assign it to item one at a time as it spins through each of those items. And then inside this loop, I'm going to test each item's dot parent. And that's how you access uh, what an item's parent is. And it will either give you an item or it'll give you none if the item is unparented. Um, or if the item is parentless. And then if if the item does not have a parent, it adds it to the list of things that I created up here. So it, you know, at the end, I'm going to have just a list of things that do not have parents. Now, if I scroll down, this is called a list comprehension. I'm, I'm not clicking on the line because I don't want the, the highlighter to kind of goof up the, the colors, but this is called a list comprehension. And what this does is it is meant to alleviate four lines of code in one line of code, but people can kind of use these and throw them out there. And, you know, I wanted to explain kind of like what it's meant to do, but we, if you look at it, it has a nearly identical layout, you know, four item and scene items. And I have that same line right here. And then right, you know, like right after four item and scene items, I have, here's the check. If item.parent is none, and then over here, you know, there's the item. So it allows you to kind of, um, take a list, spin through things, test something kind of basic on it, and then get, you know, just get a list of items back from it. And this is something, you know, pulling from a, uh, from a Google, uh, uh Python crash course. Um, he had a great, a great line from this piece of training was he said, with great power comes great responsibility. You can cram a lot of logic into a list comprehension. And I would kind of caution you you know, if you're just starting off, don't worry about it. You know, you, you'll, you'll probably be following the same example, the same line right here, but you know, with great power comes great responsibility. You can cram a lot of logic, a lot of like a lot of stuff into a single list comprehension. And I've seen that happen. And just for the sake of code readability, you know, try to, you know, try not to do that. But, <laughs> um, but anyway, now that I've kind of covered that, I use the same list comprehension in the first example that I have. And this is just this is a script that alphabetizes all of the meshes in the scene. Um, so to go through it line by line, and hopefully, you know, hopefully everyone's kind of following along, um, I import the TDSDK, I get the current scene again, and then I get all of the mesh items. 
And here I'm not using the symbol file just to keep it kind of clean. I'm saying all of the items of type mesh and the TDSDK is smart enough to know when it gets certain object types. Um, it's just to use the symbol file is considered uh, you know, more proper, um, more uh, like proper coding. But with the TDSDK, it's not it, it's not necessary. And I would say, you know, stick with stick with what's comfortable. Um, and I just wanted to explain kind of why without, you know, getting too caught up in it. So I get all of the mesh items in the scene. And then here I'm using the exact same code I used in the previous example, a list comprehension, where I'm spinning through all of the items and I'm saying, you know, do you have a parent? If not. And then I get the list of all of the items that don't have parents. And the next line turned out to be a uh, much more complex than I intended, but it was something that I thought you guys might have to do when you're doing things in Moto that um, that I wanted to cover. And it's kind of spooky looking code, but I want to explain what it's doing. And you know, with with that said, I also want to say don't be afraid to use like code that you don't quite understand, like in your script. You know, there's as you change things about it, as you break it, as you kind of like figure out how it works, it'll start to click the more you use it. But, you know, the, the important thing is to kind of get your tools up and running, you know, like if, if you're tasked with kind of creating a tool for some guy at the end of your cubicle row, like, you know, making, you know, don't get too hung up on, on how to do things the proper, well, I mean, you know, always keep it in mind, but things will click, you know, the, the proper way of doing things, the, the correct way of doing things. But um, I just wanted to, kind of explain that this is this is a complex little bit of code. So if you don't quite understand everything that it's doing, you know, don't don't worry about that. It'll start to click the more you use things. But what this line does is it takes all of the meshes and there's a command, all of the uh, meshes without parents, and there's a command in Python to sort an item alphabetically. And it's called sorted. And you can give um, give this line a list of meshes and it will sort them one at a time alphabetically. The problem is, and I'll kind of show you what I mean back in Moto. If I, if I say uh, I'm going to get the, the mesh object named banana, I'm going to say moto.scene, look for an item named banana. And that's, that's the, the syntax for doing exactly that. So it will have found the mesh that I specified using just the quotes, the, the string name of the item. And if I print banana, that is the mesh item. That is what Moto gave me back. And that's exactly what this is going to find is all of the root meshes. The thing that I discovered when I went to kind of sort by meshes is you actually don't want to sort. You want to sort by the items dot name. And to access the name, it's actually dot name on the item. And this turned out, this is what caused that um, that sorting command to become much more complex. So if I look back at the sorted command, I'm saying, here are your root meshes. And the confusing part of it is this last half. So uh, to explain what this is, um, what it's doing is replacing, like as sorted is spinning through all of the items, it's saying, don't use the actual item itself. Look at the item and pluck the dot name of that item and use that instead. So what it's doing is it's accessing something on that item and using that to sort. Um, and then the last half, um, dot lower, that's basically just um, forcing the name of the item internally. It's not renaming the item, it's just saying for the sake of this little bit of code, um, make the name of it lowercase. And the reason, and I kind of explained this because you'll probably run into it. If I say print.name, you know, it's giving me the actual name. And as an example, I could say print.name.lower. And all that does is force it to lowercase. And there's another one for uppercase. The reason why I did that is because Python is kind of dumb how it sorts things. It will, it, it basically what it does is it assigns like a numerical value to like every letter. And it, it does that like capital letters first and then lowercase letters last, which will force all of your capital, uh, your capitalized meshes to the top of the alphabetical list and every like lowercase mesh to the bottom of the list and then sort them there, which made the, the this example a little bit more complex, but it's something that I have a feeling people might bump into. And it's a it's a great example for you know how to how to do exactly this. And 
you know, you might use the same exact code in all sorts of places for just plucking, you know, the name off of something and then forcing it to lowercase. And that's what this line does. So huh, now that we're getting onto the next line, I am, now that I have all of my root meshes and I have all of the meshes sorted by alphabetical, uh, by alphabetical order, I can loop through them and set their parent. So this is another standard for loop. It changed a little bit using enumerate, and this is another example that you're going to see a lot. All enumerate does, and it's not black magic, it's not super complex, all it does is it breaks a list of things into two, where the first item that you have will be how many times you've gone around that loop, and then the second thing will be the item. So it's almost identical to a standard for loop, but it allows you to keep track of how many times you've spun through that loop. And in this code, I use the order of the items to say where they appear in that parent list. So it'll kind of reparent it, um, you know, first item, second item, third item, and it'll, it'll reparent it using that. And then the second half of the code is nearly identical to what I'm doing in the first half. I'm just saying um, for all of the meshes that do not have parents, test if they have children, dot child count. And this will give you back either a zero or however many children that they have. So that, that way, if something doesn't have any children, it just skips past it. You can say um, just as easily, you can say, um, you know, give me all of your children. And from here, you can also say, I only want meshes. And then I'm doing the same exact thing in this next line where I'm sorting the children by alphabetical order. And lastly, I'm doing set parent nearly identical to what I had before. So if I just, you know, copy and paste this and run it in Moto, it'll alphabetize all of my meshes um, in order. And this is, you know, I, I hope that this, it's kind of a basic example, but I put a lot of things in it that I think um, you guys might encounter or a lot of like little bits that you guys can like pluck out and put in your own code. Um, so let's see where I'm at, where I'm at with my outline. Uh, doo -doo -doo. All right, so uh, getting to another thing, and hopefully everyone's still with me. I'm, it's been kind of quiet. Hopefully my computer hasn't locked up. Um, but You're anyway, doing awesome, and, and it's going great. Excellent. Don't worry about it. Oh, excellent. Good deal. <laughs> I'm like, hopefully I haven't been talking for the last half hour, and nobody's there. Still I find it riveting. You haven't heard anything because oh, it's going great. <laughs> excellent. Okay, so another thing that I did, another kind of basic tool that I created, and it's, and it's easy when you get access to like a C++ SDK or like a Python SDK, it's like, oh, great, I get to make that, you know, that like mesh exporter that I've always wanted. You know, it's it's easy to jump to like the really complex things that you can create, but it's the little like quality of life things that tend to make the biggest difference. And to explain what I mean, one of the things that I did in Moto and that, that I do at work, and it, it's something that I never thought would be um, that natural was um, I have remapped my F2 key to a rename prompt where if I hit F2 and, you know, I can type in the new name of, you know, an item and hit enter and it renames and it renames that item. And I can just, you know, I was hitting F2 in my, in my uh, operating system all day to rename files. And then it only became natural once I thought of it, that I could just map that to F2. Now, the reason why I made this a command of my own is there's an interesting nuance to Moto and Moto actually has an item rename command, and I'll show there was something about that command that's built into Moto that I wanted to change. If I switch over to the shader tab, Moto lets you, and I'm not holding any other button, but I'm just clicking with my mouse, lets you select a, a, uh, a shader to item or something in the shader tree, and then switch back over to my item list. And it doesn't look like it, but I now have two things selected. But as I'm like left clicking over here, and then I go up to item, Dot re, uh, item rename, it will fall down because I actually have multiple things selected and I, I didn't want to like mash the space bar to like drop all of the things that I had selected. So I turned, I made a, a new item rename plugin um, that allows me to just hit F2 and all it does is it just grabs the last item that I have selected. And it's like once I had enough Python under my belt in Moto, like I just made, and I'll, I'll post this as well so that you guys can kind of muck through it. Um, Unfortunately, I, I made this before the the new um, TDSDK, but it would be even easier in the TDSDK to do. But all it does is it just creates a little prompt and fills it with the the last item that I have selected, and I can and I can rename it. And if you look at this example, there's a little bit there's a there's an interesting 
part to the bottom of it that um, you might wonder like what I'm what I'm up to down there. Basically, what I also did with that rename command is I embedded a little check that will remove characters that most other programs don't like, like, you know, bouncing back and forth from Moto and Maya, like sending things back and forth. Moto kind of lets you use spaces and quotes and, and you know, like brackets and things like that in items names, um, parentheses and things like that, that most programs and like render engines and like external programs do not like. So I, I, doing this allowed me to also embed, like if I name an item and I say, you know, like I add, you know, a space and and hit enter, it'll replace things with an underscore to kind of keep it clean and more like universally friendly if I'm going to be sending stuff in and out. And it's just, it like this little thing took me, you know, just a little bit of time to put together and it has completely sped up my workflow. Um, and it's funny that it's the little things that you really latch on to. And to kind of go into the next example, and and um, so another thing that that dropped with Moto 901 was Moto 901 now has access to PySide. And if you're unfamiliar with PySide, it's it's a UI framework. It's it's a it's a very friendly UI framework that allows you to kind of create dialogues and interfaces and things. And I have an example with the Doom exporter um, that I put together all in PySide, but. One of the things that PySide lets you do is get access to the system clipboard. And I don't think maybe the C++ did um, could do the same thing. But having PySide available, I made another command that I've mapped to my F3 key. And if I hit, uh, if I select an item, oh, I've got to stop clicking on it. If I hit F3 and I have, you know, in my little Python output, um, it copies the name of what I have selected. Oh, actually, it looks like I have a couple things selected hit the space key. If I hit F3, it'll copy the name of that item to the clipboard. And another thing I can do is if I have multiple things selected and hit F3 and, you know, hit paste again, it copies each item to my clipboard. And this is something that I do at work all day, every day, you know, like when I'm kind of like clicking on something and I'm like, I double click and I, or like I click and then I hold and left click, you know, and then you like wait for the box to, to pop up and you hit control C and then you go over to your script and you hit control V. Or like you click down here and you're constantly like, grabbing names it's it's funny that like the little things that you're like why do i keep doing it like that it's like it 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 requires somebody like looking over your shoulder to think why do you keep doing it like that why don't you just make it a script and it's like once you think of it it's like whoa you know like why did i ever think of that before and it's like i would not have been able to do this if moto did not have oops, if moto didn't have pi side like that is that is the one thing that that pi side lets you do other than uis is like it has kind of like lower level stuff now this you don't really have to get into all of the pi side stuff but that's basically what i did with this example was i just used pi side for none of its gooey stuff but just to get access to the system clipboard um, and i won't go through all of these line by line but if anybody has questions i would i would be happy to answer but that's another example so getting into some kind of getting into the the last little bit of the talk um uh, getting into uh, some examples of some more complex things that I created. Um, if I, let's see, if I click on this and I open up a scene. Now, this is the thing that, that uh, Greg was talking about earlier. Um, when I first started digging into the Doom, the Doom code, uh, the cool thing about Doom and Radiant and stuff like that, at least how they put it together, is the mesh files tend to be very readable. They're just ASCII. They're they're very, they're not binary. They don't, you know, have like a compressor applied to them. You know, it's like you can open it up in a text editor, which made it really fast to put this thing together. And if I switch over to the modeling tab, this is actually the dropship that occurs, that that pops up at the very first, you know, scene in Doom 3. And, you know, I've got it in the advanced viewport and, and I, you know, kind of played around with it and lit it, you know, like this is property in software, you know, copyright, uh, you know, whatever, 2016, all of that stuff. But, you know, like I, I can't even tell you how fast I was able to put this together. And this was, this was even using like a, like an earlier like version of the, of the TDSDK, um, like kind of like before it came out, you know, like as it was kind of being built, it's, but even then, I mean, like I was able to put this whole thing together of like regenerating meshes. And, and the cool thing is like, I was able to pull the skinning off of the item. And I kind of, uh, you know, I built like a little simple rig in Moto to like do the same thing, um, in Moto and, and, you know, if I switch over to the rendering tab, um, I believe, you know, Greg fired this off to to some of the guys at Luxology when I 
uh, got this up and running. I'm like, hey, you know, like check it out. You know, it worked. Um, and I, I, it made this thing so fast. Like I got this thing up and running in like a month of like weekends and a few evenings. And it was so creative and fast, you know, like there was, I didn't even have to use the older like C++ Python. I just stuck with the TDSDK and it was so fast to get this thing up and running from building the meshes in the scene to like, a, like finding the skinning. I mean, there were certain things that I thought was going to be a nightmare, like, okay, skinning, you know, like how do I, oh, and there's like a command for doing exactly that for like creating a, a deformer and, and assigning a vertex to a bone and here's your skinning information. And, and it made it so fast and Oh, I have a, let's see, another example that I have of the Doom and of the uh, the exporter. Let's see. There we go. And I also created an exporter that I'm still kind of working on, um, you know, like Brad kind of harps on in his modcasts about, you know, the last 10% uh, takes 90% of the time. You know, there's still things that I want to clean up, but I thought that it would be appropriate to have the first, you know, the first item kind of through the mesh ex or the Doom exporter would be Moto's chicken. Uh, so this is um, Moto's uh, mascot uh, chicken placed in Radiant inside the Moto level. I, for some reason, I couldn't get it compiled. Uh, com I was kind of fighting the Doom compiler to get this guy to show up. I kept loading up the level and he wasn't there, but he, I have a feeling I was just fighting the, you know, like the level compiler, but I thought it'd be fun to, to have him be the first guy that I tested the exporter with. And that was equally as easy to do. And it was awesome. But, you know, kind of an aside, um, you probably wouldn't want to create like a mesh exporter and importer using, you know, Python. There are things that Python kind of fall down a little bit and it's like really dense meshes and stuff are things that you tend not to want to throw through Python. Python is a little slow at chugging through lots of stuff. And, but again, like being able to put this foundation together, I could, you know, I could hand this to, well, I mean, using the work example, but like getting something up and running. So where you can put something in the game where like, Hey, here you go before I run off to C++ or I start to like create the most amazingly designed thing in the world and take my time at it. I could throw this thing together really fast without having to get wrapped up in any of that to get the guy, you know, the guy at the end of the row who's waiting for a tool to get something to him that lets him at least get through it, you know, to his like level review or get something in the game. And, you know, like that's kind of the most important thing is, you know, kind of uh, it's kind of our mantra in the department is get it up and running. You know, like you can you can create the most amazing uh, tool in the world, the most like, uh, you know, like the most amazingly designed tool in the world. But if you don't get that guy what he needs at the end of the row in time, like you're not doing him any good. So that was what I was so excited about with the TDSDK is just how friendly and approachable it was. Uh, to use and to create things with it. And uh, the last example that I have, and this is, um, oh, actually, never mind. One last part to uh, the Doom exporter is I, in PySide, and this is an example of a PySide UI, I created uh, a UI for the purpose of just, this is just kind of like a proof of concept, but, you know, to kind of give it like the, the mesh exporter importer, like a front end to it. Um, and it's it's just a very basic, you know, ex mesh exporter. It let, like lets you pick, you know, like the uh, the export type. It lets you kind of add new entries. It even it even lets you like kind of color code and like compartmentalize like bits and pieces of the ship. Um, and you know, all of this stuff is done in PySide, and it is really really friendly to use. And I, I hope to kind of cover that, you know, kind of going forward um, in the future. But it it's really, really friendly to use and doing all of this. And it's to, to kind of get off on a little bit of a tangent. It's funny, like when you create something that like lets you like, oh, you can just color code things if you want. And it'll kind of, it'll kind of split things up how you want. And then, you know, you, you kind of think of that as like an aside. It's like, it doesn't do any exporting. It doesn't do any kind of like heavy lifting. It's just kind of a fun thing. And then you look over, you know, like a month later on the, you know, the animator sitting next to you and he's got his second monitor turned on its side and it's full of like 120 color coded exports. It's funny, like the little things that you add is like, hey, that's kind of cool. You can just turn the color of it, you know, and, you know, it does, it, it's like, that turns out to be like the one thing that they like love about the tool. Not the fact that it works, but like the little things that you kind of like, oh, I can do that. That's cool. You know, like I didn't know the pie side could do that. And then you add it and then, you know, so for some reason, like that's the thing that they're like, oh my, you know, like this is great. Um, and then one last example, getting, oh, come on, Windows. I think they want to dock this to the side. You know what? There we go. Um, one last example 
I will open up um, a, oh, and to explain, um, I don't know if I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, but I'm also kind of helping out with Trollbridge, which is a, uh, a community film. Um, like, look it up. It's really awesome. It's a community film um, completely driven by uh, efforts from the community and it's uh, animated in Moto. And um, like, this is the main character of it. This is one of the scenes that I'm kind of working on. And in PySide, again, I made a Trollbridge picker. Um, now there's a lot of like, Pi side code going under the hood, you know, for like the the click regions and the highlighting and stuff like that. But like, all of this you can do in Pi side, and this would not have been possible, you know, prior to Moto 901. And like leading up to the release of Moto 901, when I saw that it had Pi side, and I saw that like multi line Python editor and that new TDSDK, I was, you know, I was I was done. You know, I was like, okay, you know, like anything else is just uh, that's kind of the cherry on the top. You know, I'm I'm sold. And, you know, the last example that I had was just a, 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 a graphical UI for kind of grabbing different parts of the character. And PySide lets you do all sorts of really cool things, like, like you can get button states. Like if I hold down the control button, I can deselect things. If I hold down shift, I can, I can click on things. I can drag my mouse around and you can get that. You can, you know, double click or fire code when you select certain parts of the UI. Now this is this is kind of a custom UI implementation, but all of this stuff is available in PySide, like dragging your mouse around and, and shift clicking and stuff like that. And, you know, I mean, it, this, I, I got this thing, you know, I had the PySide UI all put together, kind of the under, under the hood code for this put together. And I it, like, I got this thing up and running in Moto in like an hour. Um, it was so easy to just kind of like take it, plug it into Moto. And then, you know, kind of like when I click on something, it's like, I want to grab the, you know, spine upper bone. And all I had to do was just kind of like update the Moto code where it's like, oh, import Moto, you know, like item, you know, scene item select, you know, like the name of the item. And it's like, I was able to just get all of that up and running really fast by just replacing the Moto specific stuff. And everything else was just straight up high side. And one of the one of the other benefits of having PySide is, if you're, if you're if you're just kind of like working on your own stuff, like you probably don't have to worry too much about this. But if you're working in a log, a larger environment, like with multiple tools and stuff that also have PySide, you can take the same UI and plug it into any of those other programs, and you have kind of a a unified visual language for like your UIs because PySide is kind of like you know like in Nuke, like I could take the same thing and I could I could make another kind of like picker thing for nuke and just plug it right into nuke and then just replace you know the the moto code with nuke code and stuff like that so it's like the the release of moto 901 has been really really awesome and and i was just you know over the moon with the things that that it got and um and you know it's just been really awesome to have and and to kind of to thank the devs um, like Evo and Gwyn, um, who are the two main devs. Hope, hopefully, I'm not missing anybody. Those are the two kind of names that keep popping up on the TDSDK. Those are the, those are the creators of it. Those guys sit in the Skype channel um, and will help question, you know, like field questions and stuff. And I remembered as I was creating the Doom exporter, um, you know, the Doom engine uses something called Quaternions, which you might have heard. Uh, uh, matrices is like another thing. It's basically 3D space, uh, you know, like crap. But the TDSDK, I was kind of coding my own quaternions, you know, kind of turning it back from like Doom code and whatever. And I asked, I was like, hey, is there any possible way that, you know, like maybe you guys could like add a few like handy quaternion stuff. And then the next drop of Moto, like it was all built in, you know, it was awesome. It's like I had everything that I could just like nuke half my code dealing with quaternions. And like, it was just all built into the TDSDK. So like the devs have been awesome and they have been responsive and they have, you know, they, they are so cool um, that they just, you know, like kind of like pluck out like a little line. I didn't even know if anybody read it. And then suddenly it turns up in the, in the TDSDK and it has been awesome. It made things so much easier and faster. And, you know, anyway, so hopefully um, I haven't lost anyone. Um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. So thank you very much for, for kind of sitting through that whole thing. I hope you guys kind of took away a little bit and definitely get in those, you know, the Skype and Slack and, and Steam channels if you have questions and learn and, and just start, you know, just throw that out there because we would love to help. 
very cool, man. No, that yeah, I don't. I, I don't. You may have lost people by uh, just the one thing of talking about a technical topic, but I'll, I'm just going to say, yeah. Nick, you 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 nailed it for a technical topic. This was <laughs> a you. great presentation, and even when I brought up, hey, I want to do one one of these sessions on. Uh, on scripting, I had a few responses that were like, that would be nice. I don't know if that's the best idea because, and just because it's a technical topic, but you, you nailed it, man. This this was a great oh, presentation and, uh, you know, thanks so much for doing it. Um, oh, and I mean, I, I think we need to get you to do a tutorial. <laughs> uh, hopefully. 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 Yeah, yeah we'll see. I maybe maybe that. that's possible. I've seen a few yeah. of the videos you made and those were impressive too. <laughs> And so uh, it's great to have you as a Moto user and glad we got to have you on here. And hopefully if, uh, as, as these webinars continue, maybe we can bug you about that further on down the line because you know, all these webinars have really been about very basic things and I'm hoping we can get to more complex things later on down the line. So maybe we could continue with other, other scripting sessions that are like, yeah, hey, we've already taught you this, let's take this further. And uh, I'm gonna let my brain melt out of my ear a little bit as I watch over this video again and, and try and start using some basic scripting tools. Because it's so, I mean, you just even as you get familiar with the 3D application, it's so easy to see the things that could be scripted, but you have no idea how to. So yeah, I think it yep. gave us all a lot, of, a lot of perspective there. So thanks a lot, man. This was absolutely, absolutely. phenomenal. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do really quickly is uh, I'm going to just turn the uh, stream off for just about like 30 seconds to a minute. And uh, we're gonna add Farfare or James O'Hare. And uh, now we're gonna see what James has to show us regarding baking, because nobody knows baking better than James. Okay, so I will be right back. Hold on. <laughs> 